will say one thing. In a universe dedicated to making Homo sapiens sapiens a one-term species, this is the Blinky Moskowitz Show with Blinky Moskowitz. Good morning, everybody. Blinky here. Uh, today is uh, Dusty Rose Sunday. Secret 
Dusty Rose here on uh, Blinky Crow's Nest Sunday. I am Blinky. I atop the fabulous high tour somewhere between Mine Torn Road and Lake Frederick. Coming to you quasi live here in the shaky, shaky landscapes of Los Angeles, California. After a long earthquake drought, the ground is rumbling once again, and I can feel that that caffeine like base animal fight or flight kind of feeling like deep inside me you know it's not that the shaking is is all that dramatic these are very minor quakes and aftershocks but it uh it ignites uh, uh something primal and basic in me and probably others uh <clears throat> one of my favorite things to read on facebook is uh enough already you know hey stop with the earthquakes um but it's something akin to drinking strong coffee and uh it's a it's a feeling i recognize because i was here in uh, 1994 for the north northridge earthquake uh i was here for for the northridge quake and uh um that definitely got the adrenaline flowing for well that sent me on a on a on a kind of a fight or flight adrenaline binge for a couple of months. I think I I think I spent a lot of cr- credit card money. It was a glorious period of unemployment and credit, but uh, I don't want to go into that right now. Anyway, uh, it is Sunday, and you know, um, what have I been doing? You know, uh, I'm not going to tell you. Uh, except to say that uh, there's some cool stuff on the horizon. Um, but I'm just trying to uh, collect my thoughts and come from a direct location. You see, I think I'm a, I'm a victim of social media and the communication explosion. Um, a long time ago, I wrote a short screenplay called Kino X, and it uh, took place in 1992, so before the internet, and uh, talked about the future of movies and storytelling and media and so forth, uh, television, mass communication, crowd control. Um, without the foreknowledge of the internet, my character was uh, was predicting a future where there would be a democratization of art brought about by the advances of technology because at the time camcorders high eight was the top consumer uh, 
piece of equipment if you could get your hands on that. Um, so I've sort of seen that prediction come true, but in, in ways that I, that I never could have predicted. Um, first and foremost, I predicted that, uh, that, that the democratization of art would solve a lot of problems for lone artists who couldn't fit in with the system, couldn't pay their dues, didn't get lucky enough, didn't get picked. I mean, we can go on. We can do a whole program on the myriad reasons why somebody doesn't make it in Hollywood. But we can also go on about how these people who supposedly don't make it actually stay here and keep making it. And what they're making is anything from, you know, 99-seat equity waiver plays down in Hollywood to uh, staged readings of their work to whatever. But that's a whole other that, that's that's a whole other other program. Um, this program is about earthquake weather, and uh, maybe I'll read a poem later that I wrote back in '94 about meeting a girl after the earthquake and then not, and then losing touch with her in the in the wreckage. Well, there wasn't really that much wreckage, <clears throat> uh, to be honest. Um, but. Uh, we are here in the crow's nest. Um, for those of you who are new to the program, uh, the crow's nest is, uh, is uh, well, best way to, des to describe it is it's a piece of uh, military surplus that I picked up cheap uh, at the end of the, uh, when the NSA was being um, investigated, uh, they found a number of projects uh, that uh, they deemed cancelable. And one of them was uh, interspatial transdimensional vortex travel. Um, it was proving to be, well, A, too expensive, B, it was very difficult to get volunteers, and C, it was disrupting the time-space continuum in the multiverse and uh, causing aberrations and, uh, and uh, hellish disruptions um, all over uh, the multiplicity of creation. So um, they, they saw that as a good reason to shut the program down, but they had a lot of equipment left over. And uh, one of the uh, one of the pieces of equipment was uh, was uh, it was called the Baba Yaga project, and what this was was it was a uh, a military vehicle, um, basically. A, well, if you know about the Baba Yaga uh, myth, uh, Baba Yaga was a spirit uh, or of some sort, a god, a demigod. I'm not sure. I have to do my research. Um, who uh, uh, lived in a walking hut, right? Lived in a walking hut somewhere in, I don't know, Kazakhstan, maybe. And uh, so the when the military was developing this program, um, they, were, they were trying to create these levitating platforms that could be made in varying sizes. Uh, um, one could be the size of a, of, a, of a tank and could function as a tank, but they're also on, uh, they were, they were, they looked like watchtowers, you know, four-legged watchtowers with a platform on top, and they could be made larger or smaller. But the thing is, they were levitating platforms, and they could fly around. So they were basically like mobile fortresses. Um, and it was a, it was a, a great plan because once you got into this, uh, um, this mess of trying to police the multiverse and 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 get it, get on top of that whole thing, um, well, logistics becomes an issue, you know, you can't have a good line of communication and supply through the vortex uh, tunnels because they're they're just too unstable for matter, um, and uh, so what you end up having to, to do is go in like airborne troops, you know, completely self-sufficient. Um, but if you're going in there for an extended period of time, uh, you need to bring everything with you. So the idea would be, uh, you bring your whole, uh, you know. You bring your whole world, uh, fort with you, basically the whole fire base. You know, think of it more like a battleship or a, or an aircraft carrier. You know, but it was just called the Baba Yaga. Um, here I have it uh, off of uh, Wikipedia. Um, it's Slavic folklore. Baba Yaga is a supernatural being, um, or one of a trio of sisters of the same name. Ooh, that's like the witches in in McMurphy. Who appears as a deformed and or ferocious looking woman. Baba Yaga flies around in a mortar, wields a pestle, and dwells deep in the forest in a hut usually described as standing on chicken legs. 
Baba Yaga may help or hinder those that encounter or seek her out and may play a maternal role in a So, uh, flies around in a pest mortar? That's not the story I heard. Anyway, somebody at the Defense Department must have gotten it wrong because they named this thing the Baba Yaga. I guess because of the hut with the chicken legs. Anyway, um, it's uh, useful because it's made out of trans-dimensional material, uh, which means it's molecularly phase-shiftable. Um, it, which means we can it, it can change size and it can uh, and it can um, it can perform temporal phase shifting, which is I can slow time down from my perspective and speed it up. I don't like to do it; it gets a little tricky. I like slowing it down, speeding it up. I don't like it because too much of my life goes by. And um, contrary to popular belief, I am not technically I am not immortal. Um, so, but we'll do some of that. We'll. we'll We'll freeze time, you know, do a little radio bullet time. And, and, and you want to know what that's going to sound like? Like, ready? Like this. Yeah, because that's a totally visual thing. Anyway, uh, let's see. I got a giant killer update. Let's just roll with that. Okay, the giant killer, uh, my feature film project, which was initiated in the year 1996, um, filmed in the year 1997, 98. 99, 2000, uh, 2003, um, with uh, the majority of the special effects uh, still to be photographed or, or generated. Uh, the current state of the motion picture here in uh, the last day of March in the year 2014. Uh, there is a new draft of the script. It's now a 70-page script, and I've eliminated the uh, many uh, familiar features such as the debris cloud and all that crap about living on the ship it just uh, I have uh, I think cracked a code that uh, reduces the chaff so to speak to um, more of the original concept which look let's not get into the absurdity of this situation where you know it takes me 18 years to get back to where I started I don't want to know about that because I'm going to be 50 in September and you know I still think I'm 30 you know I'm going to play that Jefferson Airplane song later about Lather. By the way, who would name their kid Lather? I don't know what goes on over there. But anyway, uh, uh, it'll be self-explanatory when you hear it. Um, anyway, uh, State of the uh, Giant Killer is uh, 70. Currently, there are uh, 93 special effects shots in the most current breakdown. Um, the last special effects breakdown I did on the picture was, it says here, my... I've got the sheet here in front of me. Uh, it's dated uh, March 16th, 1999. Okay. Um, with uh, revisions made on uh, March 29th, 2014. Um, so we're at, at 93 shots. A lot of it's still miniature work. <clears throat> but basically the story right now is very simple. Um, and, and the key, I think, in this particular season of resurrecting this beast of a project um, the key factor this time for example in 2011 what prompted me to dig this thing out of the dustbin and start working on it again was I bought a firewire cable for my Hi8 camera and that sent me down a rabbit hole in 2011 I did not finish the film in time for the fringe so I pulled it at the last minute although I can technically say that I took my movie to the fringe because I did take the projector and the computer and the file <clears throat> and I did take it down to the fringe and I just left it in my car and I didn't show it to anyone but I can, stay, I can say I took my movie to the fringe and I also was registered but I never had a venue anyway that was two years ago um, last year I guess I was I forget this year um, what, what did it was uh, was, was as, uh, as my friend Alan would say uh Squaring the circle, I realized all the all you need to create the pathos for for these characters is uh, just start from the very beginning. Very simply, they answer a distress call. The whole space mission is because they they heard the distress beacon. Now, for those of you out there who haven't been following this saga, which I am going to bet is everybody, because most people stopped caring about this movie somewhere around the summer of 2003. Um, I think just about everybody but myself, uh, you know, for a long time, 
kind of forgot about this uh, or wanted to forget about it. Um, it's kind of an elephant in the room, you know. People roll their eyes when I bring it up now. They used to get excited and be like, cool, you're making a movie. But then like, you know, 15 years go by and they're like, where's that? Uh, weren't you going to make that movie? You yeah. know? Um, but what, what, what did it this time around was coming up with a simple way to tell the story, being able to cut away all the footage that didn't work, keep all the footage that does work, not have to reshoot any live action per, to speak of, and really only having to complete the effects. And I saw that and I thought, well, that's, there it is. I mean, there is a movie there without a doubt. And I've been working on the ending sequence and I, I completely see it. And it's, it's, you know, it's 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 in a more doable place than than probably it ever has been, um, and uh, that's reason one. Reason two was last week on Netflix, I watched a movie called Deep Water, and it's a documentary uh, from the same people I believe uh, who made one of my favorite films, Touching the Void. Uh, which is part of my mountaineering movie uh, binge watching of last year. Deep Water is about a guy, a man named Donald Crowhurst. And everybody, Google him right now. It's a fa fascinating story. Actually, don't Google him. Uh, watch the movie first because the mo the film is is t the storytelling in in this film is extraordinary. It, you 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 think you know what's going to happen, uh, but you really don't. And the way they unravel the story and, and reveal it to you is 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 telling and it's almost it almost comes across to you probably the way it was revealed to a lot of people at the time uh, but um, it's about a man who at age 35 having seen his own father fail in business and die at an early age of shame and not being able to support his family by the way this is 1967 he's 19 this guy's 35 and he joins a, a sponsored a newspaper sponsored contest to, 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 to do a uh, solo circumnavigation of the globe in a sailboat. And he enters this competition with world-class sailors who have done this sort of thing before. No one had actually, except for this one dude named Chichester, uh, he, had, he had sailed around the world by himself in a sailboat, but he had stopped in, uh, he'd stopped at Australia for a refit. So now the task was, let's get Let's see if we if one person can go around the world nonstop, and then they would receive the prize of five thousand pounds, which in nineteen sixty seven, I don't know, I'm guessing fifty grand. I, I this is an unresearched program today, but uh, I'm just going to guess that um, something you know five thousand pounds. But this guy had very little sailing experience, um, and he clearly wasn't cut out for it. But he gets behind, but this media monster sort of gets behind him, and turns him into a a show pony. So he sets out, and all the odds are against him. But I'm not going to give away the rest of the movie, except to say this. What happens to the poor guy is is that uh, he sets out last uh, at the very edge of the deadline that is set, not arbitrarily, but to, to prevent the sailors from having to go down around the Cape of Good Hope during, during terrible storms, well, the winter storms. But he'd already left, and not being a good sailor was making terribly slow progress, and at some point in the Atlantic Ocean, it became clear to him that he would probably sink and die at this point if he tried to go around the Cape of Good Hope, southern Cape of Africa. The trimaran he had he had uh, bought and, and designed and, and and fit for this mission, uh, this voyage, uh, was leaking. He didn't have electrical electric pumps. He knew that he would not be able to bail his boat out by hand as he crossed these seas, you know, 20, 30 foot swells, this sort of thing. He, he basically was facing his own death if he attempted to finish the race. Problem is, the money people who were sponsoring him uh, were very, they protected themselves very well. They put a clause into the contract that if he, if he, if he turns back, he has to buy the boat. They won't pay for the boat. The money they put up for the boat, he has to give back if he quits and turns back, or if he turns back for any reason. So now he knows he knows he can't uh, he can't return to England because if he does, he will be humiliated, and he will be even more in the financial 
uh, stress that he was in. It would be a situation that could probably destroy him. And uh, and so there he is. He's he's out there in the middle of the Atlantic, and he has two choices. Uh, choice number one: sail forward and and die. Uh, choice number two: return home and be completely ruined and probably. I mean, who knows at that point? Probably like, in other words, he couldn't go either way. In his mind, he was stuck. So, he, what does he do? He, he decides to do neither. He, he stays in the Atlantic. And I'm not going to tell you any more of the story except to say that when I watched this film, I saw myself... I set out a long time ago on a voyage that I thought would, uh, you know, be easier than it was. And my ship was not quite fit right, and my experience level or my abilities to, you know, I, I knew my strengths, but I don't think I ever acknowledged my weaknesses, which is on, on the more practical side of things, money and so forth, uh, financing a film securing its completion, um, being able to pay people so they don't quit on you when, when things slow down, that, that sort of thing. But the real thing that got me, though, was, you know, go forward and maybe the picture will fail. Uh, maybe you won't be able to finish it, you know. Go back is like giving up and saying, ah, well, you know, 17 years, all this effort, and blah, blah, blah. Who cares? I know. It's, it gets a little silly and, you know, and overly dramatic because, look, I'm clearly not in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. This guy was communicating through Morse code. You know, he was so isolated from the rest of the world that his his mind started working on him. And he, he, he began to feel autonomous out there. He began to feel like he, he, he could do anything and, and create a reality, a narrative um, that would satisfy people. Um, but what he was really doing was noodling around in the Atlantic Ocean. And I feel like that's what I've been doing. You know, I haven't made my decision to, to, you know, put all this stuff in a box, burn the negative, forget about it, start over. Because with the technology we have right now, how many giant killers could I, could I make going forward? You know? So, it, and, and then going forward, well, that's the other thing. I'd have to go around the Cape. I'd actually have to finish the film. And then, ooh, and then we have to see, ooh, is it good or not? After waiting, you know, almost two decades for it, I mean, clearly it's not going to be, it, it couldn't possibly live up to that. So it, it has to be very low key in this, in this stage, you know, because I would, I don't want to disappoint myself or anybody else. Um, but the thought of indecision, you know, I guess that's what I'm getting at. This concept of indecision, you know, do I go forward and die or do I go back and die? I mean, we're all going to die, right? Like it all ends. It all ends at some point. It's like in that movie, The Kingdom, you know, where the, the head of the FBI, some guy's trying to get him fired and the head of the FBI goes, you know, when I was in Vietnam... Westmoreland told us all to, during Tet, Westmoreland told us all to put our dog tags in our boots because he said, we're all going to fucking die, you know. And so the guy looks at the, you know, so he looks at the guy who's trying to bust him and he says, so, you know, that's the, that's the attitude that I have is that every day I know I could lose this job, so I don't care. I'm going to make the decisions that I think are the right decisions because someday this job will end. So, but that's just the thing. See, what, what, what I've been doing is, I've been new, I've been tooling around in the Sargasso, man. I've been tooling around in the Atlantic, trying to come up with a narrative that would satisfy me. You know, do I want to do the the mockumentary the, the, about you know and make up a bunch of bullshit about how I I secretly planned to shut the production down for twenty years so I could bring my actors back and have them do a, a documentary style? That was one stupid idea that I had. You know. But I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm just going to jump to the end. I'm going to say this is the real reason. Right now, here's the real reason. We are so much forward in time, so much forward in uh, technology, um, the expectations of, of a film. This film, 
uh, when we first shot it, we were we had people watch the dailies, and, and, and a lot of the comments were, "Yeah, this kind of has like a '70s vibe," you know. So the film was already retro when we made it. Um, but honestly, I think the real reason is now it's 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 a restoration project. I mean, this isn't some movie I've been I'm trying to make. This isn't my El Mariachi. This isn't my Pie, or my Go Fish, or my Blair Witch Project. Um, it was, or my or my clerks. It was supposed to be, though. That was the purpose. You know, I was talking to my mom earlier about about how last year's short film that we made, Judges, was purpose-built. That's the term I used. I said it was purpose-built for the short festival world that we're trying to, to enter with this particular project. Same thing with The Giant Killer. The Giant Killer was purpose-built to be the scrappy little $10,000 film that got halfway finished to a rough cut and then was carried forward by some major studio, which would allow me to become the next blah, or whatever, you know? And in parentheses, I look at these guys who came from that, like, you know, and I, I say good for them, but it didn't happen uh, with me for a lot of reasons, uh, mostly uh, reasons of my own, uh, my own doing. Um, so what I'm thinking is, uh, I would like to restore the film on this because I have the equipment. I don't have any, I mean, I, ha I have, you know, I mean, I've got Final Cut Pro, Photoshop, etc. I've, I've got all the equipment I need to edit um, what I have. What I don't have is I don't have high definition transfers of the 16 millimeter film negative because if you can believe this, in 1997, Photochem Phototronics Film Laboratory did not, did not, uh, they didn't m make digital dailies. We were getting them on three quarter inch umatic tape because there, there wasn't the facility for it and there wasn't the need for it because digital wasn't the end medium yet. It was still shoot the film negative, edit the rough cut with a, with a work print, a positive work print, and then cut the negative based on the reference cuts on the work print and then from the negative print to positive film and then print that film to uh, a digital format but for watching dailies no it was unheard of so when we ran out of money and uh, you know I had to get a job and that all kind of you know perennially I've had to sort of put the thing down and pick it back up again um, we just had very little in the way of footage that 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 is that is representative of the negative. Uh, the closest thing I have is some standard definition digital transfer. That we, it, towards the very end, in two thousand, when we were shooting, we got we had a f we were able to get a few of our dailies on DigiBeta. So there is some digital, but that's still just six forty by four eighty, you know, standard definition. And we want this to eventually be um, on on Blu-ray. So the only way to do that is to go back to the original negative. Everything else uh, I can do out of pocket. Um, so my plan is to do a to do a Kickstarter campaign where I try to raise the money to transfer the negative to HD and then I have a number of stretch goals. So if I can raise more money we can do more with the movie. For example, uh, maybe the negative transfer would cost three thousand dollars well if I do a campaign and I raise the three thousand well then that's done but a stretch goal is uh, you know maybe we want to pay make a budget to do some more professional special effects than I can do um, then that becomes a stretch goal another stretch goal is we pay somebody to uh, do a score um, stretch, another stretch goal enough money to rent a Warner Brothers sound studio you know a scoring stage because my friend Bill Devine has told me that uh, his dream is to score a film on a, one of those stages. And if he hasn't done it yet, maybe he can do it on this one. That, that kind of thing. So I would try to uh, get into the, um, into the crowdsourcing world by doing that. Um, I also have another kind of, uh, kind of entrepreneurial project. I want, I, I want to uh, I've begun producing uh, um, old school uh, Dungeons & Dragons uh, compatible modules that uh, I'm also going to be... Kickstartering, um, and uh, these are modules that you can play. Like I just said, you can play with the old uh, AD&D rules, and apparently there's a market for that. So we're going to find out about that as well. 
Um, so the idea would be to restore the film and then and then see what we've got, you know, at that point. Um, and then we'd have a big screening party and the, the donors and the contributors could come and, and the various prizes and things that I would give out would would be related uh, to the movies and to that that movie. Um, so that's uh, that's the Giant Killer Report. And uh, I'll just wrap up by uh, saying that uh, uh, nobody I talk to about this uh, thinks it's a good idea. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Because I haven't talked to this about it. I haven't actually talked to anybody about this except maybe one person. And uh, that that is a, that was a... a a, a session uh, where I, I, I needed somebody's honest counsel um, and, and I got it and I do believe that trying to restore this film negative to actually see it because can I tell you where we I mean this movie basically takes place on an alien planet well two alien planets but one of the alien planets is this nuclear devastated desert roiling slag heap of a war torn savage planet right Icarus they call it nothing nothing escapes once it lands there's some kind of magnetic field that inhibits radio waves it's so they can't call for this for for help and um, so but but to, to shoot this we drove up to the Black Rock Desert and filmed on the Hualapai flat and captured some beautiful location work um, there's a scene where Bergie's standing next to a hot spring uh, you know, with the mineral deposits, you know, these beautiful formations of rock, multicolored greens and blues. Um, th this is a place that, that human beings aren't even allowed to approach anymore because so many people were going there. So we were there at a time where we could get up close. Um, I don't think we did any, we had any impact. I'm, I'm fairly certain we, we had no impact on the environment. Uh, we were just there for a day, not even a day. No, this wonderful scenery, uh, golden hour, sweeping majestic vistas um, and and film so I think of it now obviously uh, it cannot possibly be the you know my scrappy little film that started my career because look I have to face it for better or for worse whatever my career is this is what it is right whatever my life has become I can't say I'm, I'm a spring chicken I'm not 27 coming into town uh, to make you know to uh, become the next whoever, right? But I've never been able to let this film go. And I don't know, I don't, I don't think that that's necessarily some kind of condition or problem I have. Like, I can't let go of things. I just, the problem is I can't let go of this thing, you know? And, and, and I think a lot, of, a lot of people close to me fear it because uh, it seems to be a dead end, a rabbit hole, a money pit, you know, a, 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 or, or even like a soul pit, you know, like as long as I'm focused on this, I'll never do anything else sort of thing because I'll never be able to do more than just noodle on it, you know. But look, authors have, have put down their great works for as long as 14 years and picked them back up again. And I'm not going to say who because I don't want to be pretentious. I don't want to compare myself to anybody because I haven't done shit yet. But the film is film. And I'm shooting on 24p, 1080 uh, digital high definition video now, and I love it because it has the same quality that the film had. But The Giant Killer was actually shot on film. 16 millimeter, the same film that the astronauts used on their missions. It's, I mean, Sitting in those boxes in there, it's nothing. It doesn't exist. It never existed. But the other way, it could exist. And frankly, a lot of people did a lot of work on this. And it's hard to make it feel that important because so many movies get made now you can't 
say that the world is waiting for this one thing and when they finally get to see it, uh, you know, the clouds will part. I mean, look, I just watched Gravity last night for the 50th time on my Blu-ray player in the, in the, in the, in the home theater there on a 70-inch movie screen. And I look at that and I'm like, oh, why do I even bother? I don't need to make movies. They, Guaron, he made he made it for me, you know. Like I, I mean the the heat's off, man. Like I, I don't have to lift a finger, dude. I don't have to lift a fucking finger for the rest of my life as a filmmaker because there's plenty of other great filmmakers and they're gonna make great films. It's just that's what I always wanted to do. That's what I always did. That's what I still do. So, anyway, call me crazy. That's the Giant Killer Report. What else is going on? I don't know. I really don't, but uh, I think it's time to uh, take a short break, and uh, when I come back, we're, we're gonna, we'll do some music. All right. <laughs>
Blinky here at the Crow's Nest. That was uh, the late James Phillips with his cherry-faced lurchers singing uh, <clears throat> Shot Down in the Streets. The song was later covered by Urban Creep and is uh, featured in the fine South African motion picture, The Bang Bang Club, a uh, film I've seen I can't even tell you how many times I've watched that film in the last year or so. Um, an incredibly touching and beautiful film about some of the most <clears throat> about some of the most horrifying acts that you could imagine uh, one group of people committing against another. But uh, uh, but the film manages to find beauty in. In, in in the horror and I think that's that's the film's strength um, after I watched the film about a thousand times I actually bought the audio uh, the the ebook and I read uh, the book that the film is based on which was written by two of the the photographers uh, Greg Marinovich and Zhao Silva um, not to go too far into the book but interestingly enough it it, it almost becomes two different animals the same story the same historical uh, telling, uh, same the same historical events, um, but the book is much more. It's it's no pun intended. It's far more literal. It uh, it's really inside the heads of these these two guys, whereas the film accentuates the uh, aspect of uh, togetherness and friendship and um, uh, the relationships that form. In these, under these circumstances, um, <clears throat> to be honest with you, I don't know about the legalities of playing other people's music on this thing. If this is like radio, I see again. This is an unresearched. This is the pilot episode, basically. I, I even forgot to state my purpose earlier because I got off on a tangent, which you're going to find out I'm going to do a lot of. I'll get off on a tangent, forget what I was talking about. Um, uh, in the beginning, I was talking about. I was telling you how I was. Uh, I felt like a victim of. Uh, of the new social media. And what I mean by that is um, the overwhelming ability to be in contact with all people at all times and uh, the, the reverse of that also being true, uh, other people being able to locate and contact me at all times. It's led me to a life of almost total isolation. I'm not going to lie to you. My life has lived almost 100% online right now because the people I have daily contact with are not physically present, you know. That's why I talk about being in the crow's nest and a, you know, come on, people, a, a phase shifted piece of surplus technology I bought from the NSA. Hey, how many, call in if you believed that. But hey, look, believe it. It's fine because this is a show, and I, you know, anything I say on the show may or may not be true, but uh, you can always pretend that it is. Um. But no, I, 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 I have a terrible problem with picking up the telephone uh, to either to answer a call or to call someone I don't go out to cafes I I don't uh, I don't do anything physically social you know it's all it's all uh, I live in a world of, of, of multimedia pen pals um, which is fine except I can't write letters to each one of my pen pals every day even though I want to but how are you going to write 300 letters every day? 400 or 500 or 800? Um, well, I came up with a simple solution. Uh, broadcasting. Duh. You know, uh, I'll, just, I'll just do a broadcast. <clears throat> what I will do is, as I'm walking up and down the furrows of my, of my farm field, I will wave my arms back and forth and cast my seeds broadly along the furrows. By the way, for those of you who didn't go to radio, television, and film school, that's what broadcasting means. That's, that's the origin of the term. It's an agricultural term. Um, so it became a metaphor. To be a broadcaster, I mean, the word sounds self-explanatory. You're casting broadly, right? But... It's actually seeds. So from the from the broadcasting, your ultimate goal is what? Life, growth, new new trees, new life, new plants, new crops, prosperity, communication, connection, 
connection with the earth, success, uh, survival, no rickets for your children. This is what the result of broadcasting is. So I thought, well, maybe I'll broadcast. And I could do, uh, I'll do an hour a week, and, which is awesome because that means I only have uh, nine minutes left. Um, and precious too few songs uh, on this one. I, I also said I was going to read you a poem, but who knows? Might have, I might have to fill towards the very end because I don't have any guests either. The show needs guests, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to have guests on the show next time. Um, at any rate, that was a tangent I went off on to close up another tangent I went off on earlier. Um, but no, Sammy's pick, uh, movie pick, uh, we'll, let's just start with the Bang Bang Club. Um, look it up on IMDb. Don't read any plot spoilers, and uh, I would say don't read the book first. Um, the book, like, like I was saying before, it's very straightforward, and uh, it's not cinematic. You know, it's journalistic. Whereas the film is a, it's a movie, it's a heartfelt movie. But uh, I won't say too much more about it except go see it. Uh, all right. Well, <clears throat> how about uh, hey? How about this?
Oh! Matthew Saldivar y los Speedways. Fifi, Fofum. Little nepotism here on the crow's nest. That's right, that was my one and only baby brother, Matthew Saldivar, currently performing on stage at Lincoln Center in Act One. Play based on the autobiography of Moss Hart. And you can catch him this summer in St. Louis, performing in a revival of Greece. All right, well, listen, hey, this has been great. This has been uh, a good time. Um, there's lots of ways to spend an hour, you know? A good episode of Star Trek with commercials, that's a good hour. Um, and I appreciate uh, you sticking around if, if that's, in, in fact, what you have done. Uh, if you're hearing my voice, you're my hero, and I appreciate it. Once again, this is Blinky, coming to you quasi-live from the crow's nest, nestled someplace between the pit of our fears and the summit of our... I forgot what Rod Serling said, but I'm not going to plagiarize him. This is Blinky Moskowitz, and uh, I hope to see you here next week, or hear you here. No, I hope for you to hear me here. I hope next... I hope... Next week for you to hear me, for me to hear you hear me, here. Have a great Sunday, everybody, and, uh, look, uh, I was conceived somewhere on or very close to the, uh, premises of Florida State University, so I can't say go Gators. I'm just not really, it's just not genetically permissible, but, uh, I will say congratulations to my friend Carlton, who is probably the greatest Gator who ever lived. And uh, his boys are going to the Final Four, and that's okay with me. This is Blinky. I'll see you next time.